Today, we start a two-week journey that focuses on the humanistic existential models of psychotherapy. These models explore areas that are highly personal and impact us in important ways. One approach that we'll study today, Carl Rogers' person-centered therapy, integrates our ability to relate to others in a caring and empathic way and utilize unconditional positive regard in our relationships. The other, existential therapy, directly addresses the meaning of life by questioning our understanding of freedom, death, isolation, and the sense of meaninglessness that occurs when we ask ourselves about our existence and place in the world. From a global perspective, these models highlight the unique experiences of the individual and are process-oriented and not content-driven. The therapeutic relationship is built on humanistic values such as unconditional positive regard and existential givens such as freedom and responsibility. We'll start with person-centered therapy and here's the mind map to get a sense of its foundation. Please pause the video as needed to review. Now there are four central constructs to this model, self-actualizing tendency, self and ideal self, conditions of worth, and relational transparency. The self-actualizing tendency can easily be recalled from a famous slogan from the army, be all that you can be, and it alludes to the potential of all persons. The next construct is congruence or genuineness and focuses on the relationship between the ideal self and real self. How much of who we really are do we actually show to the world around us? And is there congruence between both the ideal and real self? This leads us to the third central construct, conditions of worth, in which incongruence results from the belief that one is worthy only upon meeting the expectations of others. Rogers noted that we learn at an early age to exchange our basic tendency for actualization which can be defined as the motivation to realize one's full potential, for the conditioned love of others. And finally, there's the construct of relational transparency, or essential therapeutic factors. Congruence means genuineness. Empathy is the accurate ability to view the world from the other person's perspective. An unconditional positive regard can be defined as acceptance, caring, and inherent worth instead of conditional worth. These factors are so important to the therapeutic process that many believe they are essential to every one of the therapeutic models and not just person-centered therapy. Now here are some of the goals of person-centered therapy. If we just focus on the first three, how would you as a clinician work towards helping the client achieve these therapeutic goals over time? As we consider the remaining goals, remember that goals are essentially established by the client. And think about how Gloria, in this week's therapy video, came into her session with Rogers with specific goals that she wanted to achieve. Now the final goal, to increase the independence and in integration of the client, sounds a lot like Bowen's systemic concept of differentiation. How might Gloria achieve differentiation or independence and in integration? Now one way might involve her daughter. She might set a goal to establish more congruence with the person she wants to be, her real self, and the person she wants her daughter to look up to, her ideal self. With all these goals, what interventions would we use to achieve them? Well, according to Rogers, there are generally no specific techniques involved. This may be evident from the beginning of Rogers' video when he tells Gloria that he has no set plan for therapy, 
but only wants to genu genuinely connect with her and reflect what she's feeling. Roger's therapeutic model offers a lot of relational factors, but the lack of therapeutic techniques can sometimes cause problems when culture is considered. The lack of interventions places limits on what therapists can do within the session, making their teaching, guiding, or psychoeducation role more difficult to administer. The non-directive approach of person-centered therapy may not be sufficient for clients of some cultures, and many believe that the goals of the model are necessary but not necessarily sufficient for therapeutic progress. The therapist tends not to challenge the client, which may make change difficult. Please keep these issues in mind when considering culture from a person-centered therapy standpoint. Now, with its lack of structure, it may be more challenging to establish a process of therapy in terms of the person-centered therapy model. Here's a general outline, and please pause to review. Note that the client's self-assessment and motivation to change are essential to success in person-centered therapy. The therapist also needs to set the stage by providing an attentional function, which includes being congruent, empathic, and offering unconditional positive regard so that the client will be able to do what is necessary for positive growth and change. Therapist and client work dynamically toward a corrective emotional experience in which the client re-experiences the old, unsettled conflict, but with a new ending. The process involves equality in the therapeutic realm and not a one-up, one-down relationship. It focuses on the here and now, and the therapist controls the process of therapy, but not the content. The client's Motivation and insight are thus key ingredients for success in terms of Roger's therapeutic approach. For spiritual implications, I'll simply ask the question, what's in your wallet? And we'll explore this further in class. Now the second humanistic existential model I want to discuss is existential therapy. And note that Yalom, the author of Love's Ex Executioner, wrote a seminal book, Existential Psychotherapy, to explain this highly complex model that tackles the subject of life's meaning. As you consider this, think about how Yalom helped his clients find meaning in their lives. Now here's the mind map, so please pause to review. Now, there are actually many central constructs of this model, but I'll focus on three of the most important ones. Phenomenology, ultimate concerns or existential givens, and defenses, which are the result of our anxiety. Now, the first construct, phenomenology, pertains to the direct and immediate experiences of the client instead of abstract theory or a template for counseling. This should feel similar to the Rogers approach to counseling and is often associated with the I-Thou encounter of deep genuineness that is the basis of Martin Buber's work in the early 20th century. The second construct involves the ultimate concerns or existential givens and death is considered the most prominent because it reminds us of the finiteness of our existence. The Western world tends to downplay this concept by focusing on youth and consumerism, and in this week's therapy video, think about Hannah's fixation on death as a result of her early wound in life. The three remaining ultim ultimate concerns are freedom and our capacity for free will, existential isolation, or the idea that we are ultimately alone in our journey through life, and meaninglessness, or knowing that we are meaning-making creatures who live in a universe devoid of meaning. Think of how much time is spent considering life's meaning, and also reflect on Carlos in If Rape Were Legal from Yalom's book. 
Which of the four ultimate concerns were addressed in this story? What role does each of these concerns play in your life? Now our last final construct is defenses, which are related to the anxiety we experience. Anxiety can serve as a productive and motivating force to reach one's goals. Our need for specialness and recognition by others is also rooted in anxiety. And finally, the concept of the ultimate rescuer can be thought of as a source of protection from anxiety. We might think of superheroes in this regard, but there are also spiritual implications and one's God concept may be a factor in reducing our anxiety. Now for this week's case conceptualization, I want you to think about Carlos in Yalom's story. How would we conceptualize him from the three-tiered family, psych family psychology paradigm? Think about this and we'll discuss it further in class. Now the goals of the existential therapy model are somewhat general and even abstract, knowing that every client is seen as different from all others. As therapists, we seek authentic encountering in the therapeutic relationship. We help clients develop and create meaning in their lives. And we work to transform the client's newfound sense of meaning into concrete actions for their lives. As an existential therapy client, what might be some concrete change-based actions that would be applicable to your life? Regarding interventions and techniques of this model, some believe there are none, but many support specific interventions to help the client gain awareness. Paradoxical intention involves prescribing the symptom, and you should be familiar with this from the story of Marvin from Love's Executioner. And similarly, dereflection involves having the client engage in behaviors that are incompatible with problematic behaviors, such as when an anxious client is told to engage in relaxation exercises. Next, dream analysis is used to help the client bring up unconscious issues, and we've seen the impact of this intervention on a consistent level in Yalom's stories. Another important intervention is bracketing, or suspending one's beliefs and biases in order to gain a clearer sense of the problem. Read the quote below to see how Yalom used the bracketing intervention to help Carlos in this week's story. Other existential techniques include guided fantasy or visual imagery and free experiencing or free association, which is a mainstay of the more traditional psychoanalytic model of therapy. The process of existential therapy involves four stages, and before elab elaborating on this, here is an example of an assessment tool called the hardiness scale, which the therapist can administer to clients at the outset of therapy to get a sense of how they find and make meaning in their lives. Now the first step in the therapeutic process is developing the alliance using the phenomenological method discussed earlier creating an I-thou encounter and focusing on the client's beingness, awareness, and subjectivity. Think about how Dr. Erisman developed the therapeutic alliance with Hannah in this week's therapy video and consider the dialogue below that he used to help achieve this. In the second stage of therapy, the client's concerns are deepened when the four ultimate concerns are discussed and processed. Confr confrontation may even occur when the therapist helps the client discover unpleasant truths about his or her life. An example of this can be found when Yalom confronts Carlos about his maladaptive behaviors, not in a cruel way, but in a way that helps Carlos begin to truly ponder the way he has lived his life.
In the next stage, called inner exploration, the client reflects on his or her being in the world, literally asking themselves, where do I fit in? And during this phase, transference and countertransference are continually explored to make sure that the ther therapeutic relationship is authentic. And finally, disclosing and working through resistance involves the revelation of new meanings and as a result, new behaviors are implemented, uh, implemented in the client's life. Think about the incredible changes that took place in Carlos, Carlos's life just before he died, and we'll talk about this further in our next class. Have a great week.